well with others. Uh, this is a Friday morning epic session, best uh, time slot of the conference. Um, we are thrilled to be here today. Uh, we really think we're going to have a unique format and unique panel uh, discussion. It's going to be uh, five minutes of strategies for enhancing those important interpersonal skills, followed by ten minutes of discussion on some of the um, ethical issues associated with and before I move on, I want to introduce our panelists. We have Amy Elmore from Pasco County, uh, Doug Kelly from GAI, and Barry Wilcox from Leon County. Uh, and I'm Melissa Dickens, and I'm from the Hillsborough County City County Planning Commission. Uh, again, this uh, panel today focuses on uh, uh, the interpersonal skills, some things that are critical to our profession. It's what separates us from the engineers. Uh, and it's really difficult to be an effective planner without those um, interpersonal uh, traits. Um, so as we move forward in the presentation, uh, briefly I want to touch on the ASP code of conduct and um, professional conduct. Uh, so since you all are here on Friday morning, uh, it's pretty clear that there's some either some ethics and or some very desperate people who need their <laughs> ethics credits. Um, and I should point out, this is also being filmed by APA Florida, so I um, wanted to let everyone know that as well. Uh, so for the uh, ethics enthusiasts in the room, I uh, wanted to let everyone know that we are primarily going to be focusing on Section A, which is the principles to which we aspire. So those are our aspirational principles. That's um, what we should be striving to do to better the profession. It's also where um, generally we find there's sometimes some more gray area, so there's some more uh, opportunities for those discussion points. Section B is the rules of conduct. Those are the no-nos. Uh, don't, don't take bribes. Don't <laughs> fail to report your felonies. Those sorts of things. We're, um, we're not going to be going into detail on those topics today. Um, if, if anyone has any questions, we have a copy of the full code of conduct up here, uh, but, we're, but we're not going to be touching on those today. Section C is advisory opinion, so of course if you need an advisory opinion, there is that option available to everyone with the ASP ethics officer. Um, and then Section D and E of the code of conduct relate to uh, how to file a complaint and also then what happens if someone files a complaint about you. So again, we're going to focus specifically on Section A and the principles to which we aspire. And then before we go into our first presentation, I want to uh, hammer home the point about how important interpersonal skills are for our profession. It, it impacts everything that we do every day. I mean, you cannot be a planner and you cannot be able to relate to people or talk to people. Um, you know, and, and so we wanted to, to really focus on some different aspects of that. And uh, we're going to start out with a discussion of social media and online engagement, and then move to uh, mediation and conflict resolution. We'll also be discussing negotiation and influence. And then finally, communication and professional relationship building. And with that, I will turn it over to Amy, who's going to focus on social media. My name is Amy Elmore. I'm the Branch Communications Coordinator for Pasco County Development Services. And what that means is that I do all social media, websites, media liaison, PIO work for specifically our planning department, building department, code enforcement, and office of economic growth. I'm also the lead social media PIO for the entire county during emergency activations. And today I want to share with you kind of five major questions that I get asked a lot when I'm trying somebody with their social media. <clears throat> and the first is simply, how do I begin? How do I start this, this social media? And I always tell them to look at their audience. Who is their audience? And choose a platform that's going to be right for your audience and maximize your outreach that way. That way you can make sure you're working smarter, not harder. So for example, each different platform has a specific 
user. A typical Facebook user is 33 to 54 years old, married with two kids, and a college graduate. Whereas a typical YouTube user is 18 to 29 years old, a college student. I say it's getting younger and younger every day. My five-year-old niece was just enthralled in her YouTube the other day. So, um, you know, that YouTube user is getting younger and younger, and YouTube's really blowing up right now. Uh, a Twitter user, that's going to be your typical business owner, your commissioner, your politician. Whereas an um, Instagram user, that's going to be more 13 to 25-year-olds. They're very brand and trend loyal. Uh, a lot of times students and very technologically savvy. So once you've defined who your, who your target audience is, the next question I get asked is, hey, but how do I get my social media to really grow? And I tell them, make sure that you're knowing how to post, when to post, and why you post. So for how to post, make sure that you're using multimedia, your videos, your images, your hashtags, and tag people whenever appropriate. But at the same time, make sure you're crafting your posts according to your platform. So for example, if you have Facebook, Facebook users don't mind reading a little bit, getting some good content in there. They don't even mind a one to two minute video sometimes. Whereas a Twitter user wants that short, impactful punch of information. And an Instagram user, they don't even really want that, that story. They, they want the story to come from an image. They want to be able to see that image and immediately understand the story behind it. And the hashtags are very big, of course, with Instagram especially. Next, make sure you know when to post for your audience. So national statistics can give us a good guideline of that. For example, Facebook is very much a weekend type Whereas Twitter, the most popular days nationally are Mondays and Thursdays. But Instagram, you're looking at Mondays and Thursdays at 2 a.m. sometimes. So post at the times that your audience is, uh, is really on social media. And your insights and your analytics for each of your different platforms are going to help you even more than these national statistics. So take a look at when your specific audience is actually on your platforms. A crazy example is Sundays for my for my particular audience, Sundays blows up. But a Saturday morning, I'll never get anybody to read anything. So why? I'm not quite sure. Uh, if you want more information on analytics and insights of your platforms, uh, you see me afterwards and have me come. And last, always remember why you're posting. Make sure that every single post you do is ask yourself, is it true, is it helpful, is it inspiring, is it necessary, and is it kind? So think before you post. The next question I get is, oh my gosh, what do you mean? Two o'clock in the morning, Saturdays and Sundays? I, I have a job, I have a full-time job. How do I manage something like that? That's crazy. But I tell everybody, use a content management system. Many of them are even free. And uh, that way you can schedule out your posts ahead of time. For example, I come in on Monday morning, we'll have my coffee, I sit down for an hour, and I schedule out my posts for the entire week. That way I can be in meetings and conferences, and my social, social media posts are still living on, and they're reaching the audiences and going to where, where and when they are. The next thing people often ask me about is commenting controversial issues or comments. That's a big one. So I always tell people, remember that people are talking about controversial issues. And if they're not talking about it on your social media platform, they're talking about it on their own social media platform. So by encouraging commenting, both positive and negative, we can now have a seat at the table. Now an unpleasant customer experience becomes an opportunity to show that we're listening, to show that we care. A negative comment with incorrect information becomes a way that we can actually provide the right information to not just one person, but to our entire social media base. And also a great note, especially in Florida with our sunshine laws, is to remember that, especially with commenting, remind your commissioners and your public officials that any ethics that you might have within electronic form of communication also applies to social media and commenting. 
So that'll save you a lot of pain in the long run. <clears throat> and the last question I get asked so often is, okay, this is a lot. It seems so overwhelming. Is social media really worth it? I mean, I have my public meetings, I have my, my charrettes. It, it, do I really need social media? And my answer is absolutely, absolutely. Because with social media, we can reach people that we've never been able to reach before in face-to-face -face formats. And after a while, it, social media doesn't get so scary, and, and it can even be fun sometimes. I promise, I promise. And, uh, you know, we can reach people, we can reach the, the single dad with three kids and two jobs who has no car. We can reach the college student who goes to school all day and works at night and rides a bike. We can reach the firefighter who works 72-hour shifts. And with all of us together, we can use social media to make an impact and to make a difference in our communities for generations to come. So I'll turn it back over to Melissa now to discuss the principles to which we aspire for social media. Okay, so we did say we'd be switching it up a lot. That means we're going to be getting up and walking back and forth quite a bit, but hopefully the variety will help uh, keep it interesting and engaging. So um, I, I promise to keep it interesting and engaging, so I'm not going to read these out loud. Um, <laughs> but it, you can read them on the screen. Uh, these are some of the things that we should be considering when thinking about social media and online engagement. Um, but I want to ask a question. Maybe, Amy, you can start out. Uh, how do you think, uh, how, can, how can social media result in any conflict of interest issues? That's a great question. And uh, can you guys hear me OK? Okay, fantastic. So one of the things that we've often found um, whenever we are posting social media is to think about when you're liking and sharing some uh, someone else's content, uh, even just liking a certain account can sometimes provide some uh, unethical gray area. So make sure that any, um, any accounts or uh, content that you're liking and sharing is vetted. Um, if you're a government agency, usually we try and only use government, uh, other governmental bodies or nonprofits that, or educational material that's, uh, that's already been vetted and cleared. So that's one, one major issue we've faced as a county. And um, so you talked about liking and, and commenting. So it, do you ever see situations where people are uh, liking or commenting maybe political issues or cases that are, are pending, anything like that? Absolutely. And, you know, that really uh, delves into, okay, well, I've got a, a professional social media, so I, I don't ever comment or like anything that's not, you know, that's that's wrong for my professional, but what about my personal social media? Um, we have a lot of, uh, of interesting scenarios when you get into personal social media. And, uh, you know, can I like something if it's political? Can I comment about exactly what I think? And you absolutely have every right to, to say what you think and, and like things that you like. But, um, but always remember that at the end of the day, you are still, even on social media, representing your company, whether you like it or not. You're representing who you work for, and you're representing the team that you work with. So just make sure that, you know, don't get into social media spats online and things like that. Um, you know, but you have every right to... to say with what how you feel um, as long but just remember say it the same way you would if you were face to face with somebody I think that's a great rule of thumb is thinking about how would you say it if you were in the same room mm -hmm. with someone. Um, uh, Barry and Doug I wanted to, to ask you both uh, do you think it's possible to separate personal and professional social media is it do you have the same thoughts as Amy from my perspective, I work primarily in the in the private sector. Um, I uh, completely turn all things off. 
um, because uh, there's basically two clients I have, the public sector and really the private sector. I can't win for losing. So for me, I kind of shut it down. But, you know, that's that's just sort of my theory. Um, can't go wrong in that. And uh, Facebook is limited to, uh, you know, mom, dad and finding out what my kids are doing. <laughs> Yeah, I have heard people talk about the importance of privacy settings. Exactly. Facebook, making sure that you know those. A hundred percent, yeah. And Barry, um, have you ever seen any instances where people are getting uh, drawn into a work-related discussion on social media or seen anything? Uh, related to that, um, I, I think I think it's easy to have happen, and uh, especially when you live and work in the same community, um, it's it's very easy to get drawn into things that that may affect you personally. And the question becomes, where's that line in in terms of conflicts of interest? You may not be taking uh, direct payment for you know uh, in who you're representing at that point, but. Um, you know, if, if I, I am now living adjacent to a project that's going through a review by my, you know, by my, uh, by my, my board, I need to be very careful about, you know, what I'm doing out there on social media and what I'm saying, because uh, that perception doesn't have to mean actual conflict, but that perception of conflict is, is, as we say, important. Yeah, and that's right there up on the screen, um, about avoiding the conflict of interest or the appearance of conflict of interest. And um, I was in a session yesterday where they talked about, you know, the appearance is just as bad, if not worse. So being mm -hmm. really careful and cognizant about that, I think, is, is, is really important. One of the things that I know I'm careful about on, um, on LinkedIn, which is probably the tool that I use the most professionally, is... Um, so, so a lot of the private consulting firms will rightfully share their lovely photos of everyone presenting and um, uh, their projects and things like that on LinkedIn. And I am friends with many, many of you all in the room and, and those people, but I really try to be cautious about making sure that either I'm liking every firm's projects <laughs> or not. And liking every firm's projects gets a little exhausting. So, um, so I tend to, to be really cautious uh, even about that because I wouldn't want to give the perception that, oh, because my friend works at HDR and she's in a photo that, and I like that photo, that then somehow um, HDR is going to be hired or more likely to be hired uh, by the planning commission. So that's something important to, to think about as well. Um, and, and speaking to uh, some of the other principles to which we aspire, uh, Amy, can you talk a little bit about how social media can be used as a tool for um, participation and, and getting uh, civic participation in, in planning? A hundred percent. And uh, we had a really great example of the impact social media can have with our very small niche uh, social media Facebook uh, page. Uh, just this pa uh, past two weeks, in one post, we reached over 75,000 people because we asked them, hey, we need help. Tell us what you think. And 75,000 people in one post let us know. And it was it was just a fantastic example of the kind of impact you can really have in a community. Um, in addition, that social media, it, it's going to where they are. It's meeting people where they are because they're on social media already. Uh, and so by by having a social media platform, you can really provide so much transparency and education uh, and push out your positive stories and your positive messaging to change the, the face and change the per public perception that you have. It's, re it's really an incredible tool. Yeah, and it really, it really re uh, relates quite nicely to a couple of the principles to which we aspire. So mm -hmm. making sure that we're providing an opportunity for everyone to have meaningful impacts. Exactly. Making sure that there's broad participation, including those people who may not typically have that influence. So social media, I know we sort of started out with the uh, be careful uh, discussion, but it really can be a tool that can really help us meet some of these principles to which we aspire. Um, and, and it really can be a way to, to educate and inform as well. 
And I just want to add to that, one of the great things during our emergency activations is mm. we posted in Spanish, and that was some of our highest reaching posts because we were able to reach a brand new audience very quickly that we had never reached before. That's good. Yeah, it's, it's something that, um, you know, I think, so I didn't learn social media in college. I think Facebook came out when I was in college. And <laughs> so it's, it's something that we really haven't been, been trained on. And, and so we're really kind of in a, um, unless we're a social media professional like Amy, we're really in sort of a gray area with understanding, you know, understanding its power, understanding its importance, and also understanding uh, some of the, the pitfalls. And I actually had a, a quick question for the group that I was thinking of. I heard, uh, I heard Doug say he has no social or very limited social media. Unsocial. Uh, <laughs> Barry, do you take the same approach? Uh, I, 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 I use a lot of aliases, let's put it that way. <laughs> I had a few people in the room who know those aliases, so I've been careful. But it does help me provide some sort of separation uh, between, you know, my my private life and my my professional life. So. I'll have to ask you at a future. Happy hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 They change every day. <laughs> he and goes. Is there anyone in the room who's just completely is not on social media? Anyone at all? Folks. Mm -hmm. yeah, some people, it's a very conscious choice, and, and that makes a lot of sense as Good well. Good for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, and, and I wish I had that willpower. Um, so <laughs> for, the, uh, for the next discussion, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Barry, who is going to be talking about mediation and conflict resolution. Oops. Sorry. I missed a do and a don't. It's fine. Oh, I didn't expect to see myself come up with that. <laughs> uh, I'm Barry Wilcox, as, as you can see on the slide. Uh, I am the Chief Development Resource Officer for the Leon County Department of Development Support and Environmental Management. And if anyone has a longer title in the room, I'd like to hear about it afterwards. Um, I was brought on a few years ago uh, to the, I was originally with uh, 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 the best planning department in the country, right, Wayne? Um, and uh, I moved over to take over, uh, or I should say, I was second. I'm second in command. Um, the uh, the portion of the county that, that, that does building permits, code enforcement, uh, environmental permitting, and site planning. Uh, what we typically refer to as growth management, we refer to it as development support environmental management. Uh, and I was brought over because at the time they were having uh, a bit of a. Uh, a a PR issue and the fact that it's some wonderful people and still do. We have some incredible people in that division who are extremely knowledgeable, but we were taking a bit of a beating, uh, in particular by the building uh, association, Tallahassee uh, Building Association, uh, who didn't think we were turning permits fast enough and didn't think we were being customer friendly and, and, and weren't working with them as a partner, but were rather working uh, against them. Uh, and so uh, I was brought in some, for some reason they thought I could fix that. <laughs> and asked me to come over and do so. So uh, that's why I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about conflict resolution and, and mediation, but it's as much about customer service as it is about those other things. Um, and I, I was thinking about this earlier as I seen there, how many of us would have actually gone through with a planning degree or gone into the profession if we knew that like 50% of our time would be conflict resolution, right? <laughs> I mean, seriously, I, I'm as much a social worker on a daily basis as I am a planner. And, uh, maybe I should have realized that'd be the case when I read Jane Jacobs book. Uh, okay. So knowing, uh, we all, you know, obviously to, to get your AICP, you have to you have to prove that you've got your education, you have to pass a, a test. Um, so the, the knowledge base is already there, but it's more than just that knowledge base of, of hey, I, I, I understand planning theory and principles and, and practice. It's also knowing your role and knowing your strengths and knowing uh, what position you play in your organization. Show of hands, how many people have that one person in the office who tells people what they want to hear? That's it? I guess, seriously. They're being okay. filmed. <laughs> if that person's sitting next to you, I understand why you're not. Really right now, right? 
But I think everywhere I've worked, at least on the public side, we've always had that one person in the office, and people will keep calling until they get that person right. And then they'll say, yeah, well, so-and-so told me. And you're like, yeah, I know. He tells everybody that. You know, <laughs> doesn't make it factual, right? <laughs> now, is, is he being unethical, right? I mean, I don't know. If he's knowingly doing it, maybe so. But if he's just trying to appease people on the phone so that they will go away, you know, um, maybe not so. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you a, a quick example. I uh, had, a, um, had a, a plans reviewer in my building division who uh, decided that he would take on a, a floodplain issue despite the fact that he is not our floodplain manager. <laughs> and um, the floodplain manager sits like 30 feet away from him, right? And so rather than walk the 30 feet to go get the floodplain <laughs> manager, or, and I get it, if you're not a walker, maybe just pick up the phone, right? <laughs> but instead of picking up the phone and getting the actual factual answer to the question, he just decides to make the call on his own and someone goes out and buys a construction trailer to be used as a storage shed, which was a whole other issue, uh, and finds out later on that this, this trailer that they paid several thousand dollars for, that they, that they can't use on their property because the majority of their property is underwater. And it was just that simple phone call that they needed to make uh, to find that out that would have saved everybody a whole lot of grief and me probably three site visits to this guy's house to get yelled at. So, um, so knowing your role, knowing your opportunities, and knowing your strengths is, is as critical as anything. I would argue somewhat of an ethical issue uh, if you if you don't. Um, secondly, and, and working in tandem with that is, is good communication skills, right? Um, this past year. My division in particular took a severe beating. Uh, Hurricane Michael, which affected many of us here in the Panhandle, uh, uh, affected us to, to a lesser extent, but still drove our permits up significantly. That, uh, along with the economy, put us at a point where we turned 33% uh, more permits this year. Uh, that's several thousand more permits uh, than, than we have uh, than we did last year alone. Um, we're due to break an all-time record in our county uh, uh, for the most permits ever turned. Uh, and we're doing so, or we did so in a year, where we also lost our chief building official, as well as several plans examiners. And for any of you in the room who deal in that, in that realm of the world, um, if you think finding a good AICP certified planner is hard, try finding a chief building official. I literally had to use a, a recruiter to go out and get somebody. By the way, I stole the city of Atlanta's chief building for you. <laughs> you want to know the secret? <clears throat> I, it wasn't money. No, no. I mean, it was a 13% reduction in income, state income tax. But, but no, um, it was a two-hour savings in his commute time every day going both directions. He now lives five minutes from the office in a beautiful home and, and enjoys his leisurely commute to, to work each day as opposed to having to drive in at 5 a.m. and leave at 3 p.m. to beat the rush hour traffic. So. Uh, so planning played a, played a role in that. Um, so we what we were at some point during the year we were actually backlogged about 240 permits. I think was the peak. We had 240 permits sitting in house, and I had two two plans reviewers at that time. Um, I had a guy who was acting as our interim chief building official, and I had a guy who was like fresh out of school who just looked. I, every day he came into the office, I was like, yay, Josh showed up. You know, I, was, <laughs> I was waiting for him just to take a job with FedEx or something. <laughs> um, so how did we survive this? And, and by the way, we're down to 40 now. And, and that was a large part of was the hiring of a great chief building official and bringing in a few more able-bodied plan reviewers. Uh, but, but how did we survive this, what, what could have been really disastrous situation for us in terms of, of where we were coming from with the building officials, well, our associated building association? We communicated, right? We were there, we have a government affairs meeting with them once a month, and we sat there, and, and when you bring people in close, this is an old boxing analogy, right? Why, why a boxer stand so close to the ring? Because you can't get a good swing at somebody when they're right in front of you, right? And so you bring them in close, and the amazing part was we found that we shared all these, all these things. Um, they were trying to hire the same people I was trying to hire, so we could sit there and lament over the fact that nobody could find anybody qualified to hire. And they started to understand that us, the delays in turning those permits was not a choice. It wasn't like we were sitting at the office going, hey, Hang on to that one for another two weeks. Really, really, really stick it to them. No, we, I, I hated the fact that those things were sitting there. And they started to understand that. 
And we got to a great point where we did have one, uh, we did have one person who sent out the, the, the email to all the people in the organization and said, hey, is anybody else having a problem with earning permits here? And probably half the organization turned on him, and I mean voraciously turned on him, and said, they're doing the best they can. Da, 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 da. And I thought, that is a huge win. Like, that was a huge win for us. I'm way over time. Um, <laughs> so I'll go on to the next few real quickly here, and I'll just talk about educating. Every, every time you, you touch a stakeholder, in a good way. Um, it is, it is, you are, it's an ethics session. Um, you are, you're educating. You are, you know, that's your opportunity to educate. That's your opportunity to sit down with a developer and tell them why the same product they've been building since 1980 may not be the best thing to be building, you know, in 2019. It's your opportunity to sit down with that, that, that homeowner that's just so upset about the interconnect that you're about to create to another neighborhood that's actually got higher selling points, right? And explain to them that the more interconnections we have, uh, the better our transportation system works, right? So every time you're out there, whether it's with residents, your staff, um, folks in the building community or folks in the development community, uh, business owners, that's your opportunity to educate. I think that is one of the, the key things we do as planners. Um, I think people would make much better uh, decisions. I feel like our transportation networks, selling a, selling a transit system would be so much easier if everybody understood what we understand, right? Uh, so there's your opportunity. Educate them on that. Um, and along with education uh, is, is, is being fair, right? We all understand the difference between equality and equity, right? Um, real quick example, I always, I always hate when I hear about notifications and public meetings and, and I asked somebody well what did you do and they said well we, we met the minimum standards you know there are minimum state standards we did what the state says we have to do um, never the best course of action right those minimum standards are literally set there as the minimum standard and so uh, that opportunity to go out and get to people where they are uh, and bring the information to them is a fairness issue um, we had this in Leon County I'm looking at Devin right now who's looking at his phone and uh, it, 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 okay, he's, 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 he's Facebooking this whole thing. Um, oh, sorry, Twittering it because you're in a different demographic. Oh. <laughs> 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 he tries to be young. Um, but uh, we, we had an opportunity to go out and do a charrette in one of our rural communities. Uh, three day charrette starting on a Thursday, going through Saturday. When, when other staff heard that we were going to go out to this community that was well known to be pretty you know, outspoken, and we're going to sit out there for three days. They just got lost. And one of the days was a weekend. Oh my God, a Saturday? You're going out there on a Saturday? But it turned out to be one of the best things we did. And we actually, again, brought them in close, right? We brought them in close and now they're community partners and they understand that we're there to help them. We're not there to just be the regulators. So, And finally, because I am, I've taken my time and Doug's time, I think now, um, I'll leave you with the last one. Be kind. Um, these are my two daughters. Despite what you see here, they are mortal enemies. <laughs> and uh, the oldest one, the, 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 the taller one there, is scratching down. She's actually 12 now. But I remember the first day I dropped her off at daycare when she was probably, I think she might have been uh, two or three. And she looks up at me with those big eyes, like, you're leaving me here. It, it, and like, give me something, give me some advice to go off of. So as a father, you know, I'm, I'm standing there and I'm thinking, oh my God, what do I say? This is an opportunity. Um, listen, uh, don't bite your friends. Um, <laughs> keep your finger out of your nose. Uh, you know, and, and I start down this long list of things like, you know, listen to your teacher and, 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 and you know, don't talk when you're not supposed to. I go through probably what are about a dozen things like this. Over time, each day I drop her off and I try to reiterate these things. And, I found that my, my message started to narrow and narrow and narrow. So by the time her sister went to school, my message to both of them each day when I would drop them off is I just look at them and I say, be kind. Just be kind today. That's a, it's as simple as that. And when you're kind, when you're out there with you, working with the community or business owners uh, or, or residents, uh, uh, whoever, when you're being kind, it's so hard for people to be unkind back to you. Um, most of the complaints I get about how somebody uh, – Customer service related complaints from my division are when somebody's just really short and mean to someone on the phone. And then I'll have somebody in my office ranting for an hour. And it's not about the message that they got. It's not that, hey, sorry, but you know, you're close your properties in the floodplain, or hey, sorry, but you can't build that there. It's about how the message was served.
Mm -hmm. So I'll leave you with that. Okay, thank you, Barry. So here's where I need some timekeeper assistance because if I keep everyone long, I won't uh, be very popular. How are we doing on how much time do we have for discussion? I ruined it. I'm sorry. I Barry it. has destroyed the panel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll try to keep this five minutes, maybe three, four minutes. Okay, so, uh, so panelists. The, uh, one of the questions, uh, Barry, for you is how do you make sure that you're dealing fairly with two sides when there's a contentious debate? If you're in the middle, how do you, how do you make sure that you're, you're being fair um, in that discussion? Um, I think openness, you know, the, the public is, the public, uh, I'd say, misconception of, of what we do is oftentimes that we're having closed doors meeting with developers. We're coming to some sort of an agreement. And then we're, we're basically telling the community, this is what's going to happen to you. Um, anytime you can bring them all in together so that they can see the transparency in the process. And I've only recently learned to uh, really appreciate the, the sunshine law in the state of Florida, because not every state has that. And, and the fact that we do so many things out in the open that so many other states don't do. Um, one of the things we do in, in my division is we have something called project docs that we use as our digital submittal system. And uh, we can invite people, anyone, to see that sort of stuff. So it's not like this mysterious folder that, you know, that, that only the planner has access to that contains all the blueprints and, and site plans um, to the project that's going to happen next year's subdivision. They can actually go in and see that. They can see every document that's uploaded. They can see every comment we make on those documents. They can see what needs to be fixed uh, so that they, they can be approved and what we're still uh, maybe negotiating over. So I think just that openness and that 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 transparency is huge there. And Doug, do you see um, uh, similar things on the on the private side? Are you have you ever had any instances where you know there's a there's some sort of conflict or a debate, and and how is that handled from a private sector? Um, it seems like uh, it happens about every other day. <laughs> uh, you know, what Barry said, the principles still apply. It is open dialogue, open communication. Don't assume, you know, that someone is saying something uh, with this motivation or whatever, but it's really letting uh, the other side, whether it be your client, whether it be um, internally, uh, let them know what you're seeing, uh, what you're feeling. Don't accuse them. Uh, just assume the best and keep talking. That That's the key. And show respect to each other. It makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, there was a um, discussion yesterday that, where the discussion was on RFPs and RFQs. <laughs> and the, 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 the message was we, we all need to give each other a little more grace yes. and communicate as often as possible. And, and that will really help avoid a lot of the, the, the conflicts that, that we see. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question for the group. So, Amy, uh, so what? A, so Barry mentioned is taking the time to educate <clears throat> and getting, you know, making sure that everyone is, is fairly educated in the process. Do you ever see with educating through social media where people kind of staff has education fatigue and maybe there's more unique ways to educate through social media? A hundred percent. You know, and, and one great thing he said is, you know, to make sure that people understand the concepts that you understand. And uh, social media is a fantastic way to do that in a very different, original way. Make a video about a, a best planning principle that people don't quite seem to understand. Uh, help, uh, you know, hey, did you know Tip Tuesdays, you know, uh, to talk about how buildings and streets interact, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing uh, to, to help get people on the same uh, on the same wavelength that you're on so that you can effectively communicate uh, moving forward if you ever want to send out surveys or uh, want them to participate in a charrette. They can know this type of information mm -hmm. and they've learned it simply by looking through their social media. Uh, it's a great way to be transparent and it's a great way to uh, encourage that that educational tool and go to where they are. Great. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So we're going to turn it over to Doug, who now has two minutes because of Barry. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, thanks, Barry. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, good morning. It's great to see everybody here. Uh, how many of you all remember the uh, William Shatner commercials, uh, The Negotiator? I'm working for you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually looked it up last night. Um, it's still on YouTube. I love uh, <laughs> the ideal of the, 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 his, uh, you know, making things happen kind of thing. And uh, they're they're real. They've got bloopers in the whole bit. So it, you know, you're bored. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, too busy. Uh, my name is Doug Kelly. I'm uh, based in Orlando. I work for GAI Consultants. Um, I generally uh, have worked about 10 or 12 years in the public sector and about 20 plus years in the uh, private sector. Um, and what I do now is represent uh, local governments who are being sued um, and in support of those local governments. And then also uh, a lot of entitlement work uh, from about Palm Beach County to Duval County. So it's great to be here in the, in the panhandle. Um, well, mediation is uh, basically having a third party get in there and try to hash things out. Uh, negotiation is a process that <clears throat> basically <clears throat> um, uh, two or more parties are trying to reach some kind of agreement, some kind of a settlement. Um, not in a legal sense, but a, really an agreement uh, on something that can be very controversial or it could be a meeting time. You know, um, it, it, it's a broad spectrum. And our profession is really uh, provided with lots of opportunities to negotiate if you really think about it. I seem to miss that day of class when they uh, taught about uh, uh, how to negotiate. Uh, and I think what it is, we don't really have that opportunity to learn some of the skill sets that are um, uh, out there uh, in school. You learn them uh, out in the real world. Um, you think of the obvious kinds of negotiations that take place, pre-application meetings. There's a give and take, both in the public and private sector, what's expected, what envelope's going to be pushed, you know, what, uh, what information is needed. Um, obviously, in development order conditions, uh, PV conditions. There's a number of times where you know you're, you're going back and forth there and trying to, if you're on the private side, protect the interest of your clients, uh, and if you're on the public side, you know you have a very clear uh, standard there uh, to, uh, in a sense, to enforce. Um, I think, as I mentioned, there's very little education for us to really learn some of these skill sets, but um, <clears throat> in essence. Fortunately, uh, we have the uh, AICP Code of Ethics, which actually provides some uh, uh, direction in that area. Um, <clears throat> uh, whether or not um, you're in the public or the private sector, you've got to remember, who are you working for, really? I think it's a little clearer uh, in the public sector because it's the, the city council, the board county commission, it's the general public. In the private sector, uh, sometimes it is the public, sometimes it is the um, <clears throat> The, uh, the community, depending on what kind of job, uh, job and what project you're working on. But you also have a client, and sometimes your client's uh, expectations do not align with the AICP standards <laughs> of ethics. Uh, that uh, can, can be a real struggle. And uh, you know, we're all working towards resolving some kind of uh, 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 result. Uh, sometimes there's a uh, as I mentioned here, comprehensive argument for your case, you know. But what you need to remember is that you need to prepare. You need to know your limitations, and you need to know what your um, abilities are as a representative of your client, you know, the what the boundaries are. And, you know, we go from pre-application meeting to pre-application meeting, and at the pre-application meeting, staff are running, and I've been in meetings, at a pre-application meeting, and staff has to leave because they're going to another pre-application meeting. And it's just crazy, and we all kind of just run, 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 and we miss opportunities to really be able to, to deal with some issues early on that will, you know, hopefully make it a much smoother process. So preparation is really important. There's no, there's no substitute. Um, <clears throat> And, and uh, whether or not you're in the public private sector, um, you, you always, always, always remember who you're working for. Um, whether or not you read that part of the AICP standards, there is a section uh, that applies to planners. It, it doesn't say public planners. It doesn't say private planners, private sector planners. It says as planners. And uh, one of them reads, one of the aspirations is, we shall always be conscious of the rights of others. Now, I 
think that's much much more clear in, in the public sector. On Monday morning, when you go back to work, you know, you really are thinking about the, the, uh, the community. Private sector, we're thinking about a client who's building, uh, uh, you know, is, is paying us and to get a certain outcome. And it becomes very important that you don't lose sight of that. Um, and who is really working for you. We must have special concern for the long-range consequences. That's actually one of the aspirations uh, in the ASCP standards. Uh, what we're advocating for will have long-range consequences, whether they're major or whether they're minor. And if you're in the private sector, you still need to think about that. Uh, you still need to uh, remember what kind of impacts that you're having. It's just not rushing to the next project and moving on getting her done, getting her done, but it's, it's, it's really going back and saying, you know, am I really trying to accomplish these kinds of things? And how can I help, as Barry was talking about, educate uh, my client as to uh, what, you know, what we um, uh, try to keep, keep a focus on. Uh, here's just a real quick, uh, one of the, I guess this is the third uh, strategy. Uh, you think it would be real, like a no-brainer, um, but actually, keep your emotions in check is very, very important. That nonverbal, uh, those looks, those uh, words sometimes are, you know, um, it's leave that up to the attorneys. I mean, they're, they're, that's their job to, to be the bad guy, so to speak. Uh, if, you, uh, if you find yourself not uh, having an attorney to uh, work with on the private side, sometimes you, you know, you need to. Um, uh, be a little more uh, aggressive maybe in, in your take, but um, um, aspirational principles tell us that we shall treat everyone fairly uh, in the planning process and respectfully, I might add. And I, I kid you not, I have been in uh, public hearings where the, the consultant is red-faced, literally. The community meeting, he's sit there arguing with, uh, with the public who's, who's come to a meeting fight. Geez, man, are you serious? You know, it's like you're trying to learn and understand what the issues are, not fight it all out here. And you believe you think this would be so simple and just just intuitive, but it is not. And you know, the longer you're around, it's like the more of the uh, war stories you come up with, so or find or be involved with. Um, <clears throat> here's another one: uh, maintaining good working relationships. Um, I, I do have the opportunity to work through, through most of the state. Um, I haven't been to Panhandle very much. It's been really nice to be up here. But, um, and so I'm working in some locations, like day in, day out, day in, day out in Central Florida. But in other areas, it's my first time around uh, Palm Beach County uh, working on a project here uh, this past several months. First time there, a big county. Uh, 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 land Development Code, uh, I guess that's in, in film, so Land Development Code. It's a great, great code, it's very cumbersome, but you need help sometimes. And uh, it's important to, to maintain uh, great relationships with those that you work with. You know, we're both in the same business, and, uh, you know, help each other in that sense. You, you want, as a public sector, you want to make sure a project is done well, done right, with the least you know, heartache and frustration. So help us uh, when, when we're at those pre-application meetings to make sure we get the full picture of what we should be looking at. And uh, sometimes there, we ask questions uh, that cover all the things that we're interested in, but you know there's other questions you, that, that I should be asking. So help us out uh, when you can uh, with that. Um, and again, uh, make, maintain those relationships. And that's why it's great to come to uh, conferences. That's why APA and our sections have opportunities for social uh, programs, uh, or not social programs, but you know, going out and having fun together, uh, as well as educational programs, because you get to meet each other and spend time e with each other outside of the office. Um, <clears throat> again, um, the, the badgering, leave it to the uh, leave it to the attorneys, uh, and some engineers will also do that as well. Um, <laughs> landscape architects, you know. <clears throat> In any event, um, last item up here is really um, one of the aspirational principles. Uh, one of the things that will make you a great uh, consultant, it will make you a great planner in the public sector or the private sector is being reliable, being a person of your word, um, responding to city staff comments, 
in a timeline that will help them be able to get their report done. Realize that you're having impact if, if you're if you're not responding to uh, you know DRC comments and, and knowing that they have deadlines and then. You, you know, I've seen where uh, the private sector planner will go and blame the city for you know, not getting the staff report out on time. <laughs> well, did you happen to let them know that it was the day before it was due that you got your comments back? You know, you just wish that did not happen. And when I see it in, in places, I will call it out because I worked in the public side. And, I, and that's why I have a great respect for what's done in the public sector. Uh, because uh, you know, you just you, everyone's kind of like firing at you. If things go right, you don't usually hear about it, except at a conference. You know, uh, if things go wrong, you're the guy getting or the girl getting wham, wham, wham. So um, um, just just be reliable. It's it's not that difficult. It's it's follow through and uh, creating that trusting environment um, that you execute uh, on your. Uh, promises and, and the bargaining um, that might take place at the end there. Uh, at the end of the day, you want to be able to say, it was nice negotiating with you. And uh, hopefully you take these back and put them in practice Monday morning at 8 a.m. <laughs> What's up? So we will go ahead and move on to the discussion of negotiation and influence. Again, you can see principles to which we aspire up on the screen. Um, I want to ask the question of, um, Doug, I guess I'll start with you. How does perception affect negotiation and influence? How does the, the whole concept of a outside or external perception effect? I guess everyone's heard that, you know, perception is everything. Uh, perception is reality. And, um, um, you know, everyone builds a reputation. Um, you, you earn it generally. And um, I think that, you know, be consistently being reliable and responsive, whether you're, you're on the public side or on the private side. And, and it's really just about being fair. And, you know, we are all in the same profession and we really need to uh, support each other, you know, in, 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 in the endeavors. And I see sometimes attorneys, you know, um, um, jump in there and uh, they kind of force a position and the communication starts with the attorney and, and, and the public sector planner. And then the private sector guys kind of left out and it's learning information from the planner. Work together and, and um, you know, develop those, those uh, reliable relationships that you can trust people. I have um, a staff member in, um, I will mention the city of Orlando. I get calls Email responses six six thirty at night. It's like thank you, man. I mean that's great. That's um, I really admire people who who really um, take seriously what they do, and it, it doesn't stop after five. Mm -hmm. That's great. Great example. I have an assistant county administrator sends me emails at two a.m. <laughs> <laughs> they need to learn the scheduling. <laughs> Um, we, we talked a, 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 a quite a bit about negotiation. I wanted to switch a little bit over to influence. Uh, so Barry, how, how do you think someone should deal if they have a personal friend who becomes an elected or an appointed official? You know, that whole perception of influence. Uh, how does that play in? Do you be more transparent, be more open? What, what would be a good strategy for that sort of situation that may come up? Uh, it's, I don't know that I have an exact answer for it, but I think it is a growing issue as we see more and more grassroots candidates come into play. You know, both people you knew out in the business community, people you knew as neighbors who are now elected officials. And there is that learning curve there for many of those <laughs> grassroots candidates because, you know, they didn't come from a political background. They maybe didn't come from a, a, a you know, a background in, in public service like we did. Uh, so they're learning the ropes and you just have to, I think, be very mindful, again, opportunity to educate there, but be very mindful in your dealings with them to ensure that you're not crossing those, those, uh, at least the very apparent lines that, that exist for us. Mm -hmm. um, and so in terms of negotiation and influence, uh, are there any examples that any of you have seen where something was a really delicate situation that was handled uh, very delicately and very well, or conversely, 
a situation that went awry, a negotiation that went awry um, with respect to uh, the process? Um, I've uh, been party to a, it was a large master plan development um, uh, with the, um, and I realize since it's being recorded, all the names will be changed to protect the innocent, but <laughs> not going to use any names. Um, <clears throat> the uh, developer in this situation, very headstrong about what he will accept from the city. Um, and um, it was like a wall, and this is how I, this is how I'm going to do it, and, and this is how you, consultant, are going to do it for me. And um, it, I mean, it was just adversarial from day one. And I think what, um, in this case, when it seemed to be, the, it seemed to be that you were not going to res really get results out of this. Um, and it was getting to a point of un uh, being unethical, uh, the, some of the things that were taking place. I um, fortunately have a very supportive um, director who I said, I do not feel comfortable about this. Uh, I can't work uh, in a situation where an elected official is also the an attorney for the developer, and uh, that was being hidden. And and uh, there are sometimes that you know you got to say, hey, can somebody <laughs> take this over? Um, and someone did because I just didn't feel right. So there's sometimes that you got to uh, say no. That there are sometimes you can't can't beat that wall, and uh, you have to you have to move move on. <clears throat> Yeah, and that's a, that's a, that leads me to, to one other great discussion point. So what's an appropriate course of action if there there is something unethical? Um, that, you know, how should one address that or, or deal with it? There's a oh, like, there's a known that it's yeah. known on it. it mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think there are there are responsibilities to, uh, for us as planners. Obviously, if we know of, of someone, uh, I would say other planners in particular who are acting unethically to, to bring that to the attention of, 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 of a DA. Um, I, I know it happens. I I have an engineer who I have to rein in sometimes who, who wants to turn everybody in for a lot of other engineers for stuff that they're doing that they're not supposed to be doing. Um, each, I think each profession has that, that, um, has that recourse in there if it's available, uh, that's available to anybody. Um, but a, I would say tread very lightly in there. Um, I think I asked the question in another ethics session some years back, you know, they were talking about all the things that could be brought up on that. I thought to myself, I'd never known any planner to ever be brought up on ethics. So I just asked the question, has anyone ever been brought up on ethics charges in the state of Florida? And the only example they were able to give was of an elected official who had taken a bribe, who also happened to be an AICP certified planner. Yeah, and so they they uh, he lost you know his AICP over that. But um, um, I don't I, I don't see it happen quite so often. I, I think um, now if it's happening with elected officials, that's that's a whole other issue for another day. Everyone is attending all these great ethics sessions at the conference, so they're very refreshed on <laughs> remaining ethical. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and switch to the last portion of the presentation, which is, it is a little jarring to see your face show, <laughs> uh, which is me, uh, communication and relationship building. Uh, again, my name is Melissa Dickens. I work for the Hillsborough County City County Planning Commission. We handle the long-range policy planning for all of the local governments in Hillsborough County. So that's Tampa, Temple Terrace, Plant City, and Unincorporated County. Uh, in, in my role, I'm in a relatively new role, but a lot of it involves communication and relationship building. We work a lot with our local government partners. Um, several of them are in this room, uh, but we work a lot with our client governments in, in providing services to them and making sure that we understand what they need requires constant communication and constant making sure that, that relationships are strong. So that's what I'm going to touch on today. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is communication. This is a, a strategy for communication. It's called mirroring. 
uh, so I didn't realize how much it would look like these two people are on a date. They clearly are. <laughs> so maybe in planning, don't act like you're on a date with someone if you're trying to have good communication. But it, it does show mirroring, which is one really effective strategy for communication is paying attention to the other person's body language, paying attention to the other person's uh, facial expressions. The whole concept of mirroring really helps to increase rapport and trust because studies have shown that uh, people like people who uh, act similar to them. It's, it's human nature, it's across the world. People uh, bond very much with people who are, who are similar to them. So just being conscious of that body language and being conscious of communication and how you're uh, communicating with others can, can really help be more effective. Um, so that's kind of a simple strategy right out of the gate that just being aware of how you're communicating. So for example, if Barry's having a conversation with you, see this by the way, if you watch people at happy hour. So if Barry's having a conversation with me and I'm like, oh yeah, that is really interesting, but my whole body is facing this way, it's clear that I really am not interested in talking to Barry right now. So you really want to make sure that you're you know, facing the person, that your feet are pointing towards them, those sorts of things are really important and really subtle, but they make a huge difference in terms of trust and uh, rapport. So the next thing I want to talk about is some of the distractions from your message and some ways that you can, can work to eliminate those distractions. So a, a a couple of the distractions that I see a lot, which I am guilty of in this particular presentation because I said, um, a few times, the filler words is one of the things that you want to watch out for. So that's the ums, the likes, the you knows, the kind ofs, those sorts of things really detract from your message. Uh, another one that is not on here that I'm personally not a fan of is just. So when you reach out and email someone, you say, I just wanted to touch base with you on this. It's much more effective and much more direct if you say, I wanted to touch base with you on this. So being more aware of some of those words that you might use that are fillers or when they minimize or detract from your message is really important. Uh, another thing that, uh, that sometimes can be distracting is up talk. So that's where you end a sentence and it sounds like a question. So, uh, sometimes people, uh, I'm guilty, I've, I have been guilty of that earlier in my career, so something to be mindful of and making sure that you're ending your statements with a period, you're ending your statements pointing down, that's, that's also helpful, and that will help your credibility as well. So there's a few ways that you can work to make sure that you're eliminating those distractions. So if you work in the public sector, most likely you are being recorded. Uh, and so you can have the pleasure of listening or watching yourself on television. That is painful. I suggest you do it at home with a glass of wine. Uh, but, but it can be a very, very effective way to understand how you're coming across. So I watched myself recently and I realized that when I present, it's extremely fast. And so now when I present, I sort of pretend that I'm on some sort of strong sedative. Slows me down. Pretend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that, that, that can help, um, but, but do recommend if you can find a video of yourself presenting, if you can even, so sometimes when I leave a, does anyone else do this? When you leave a voicemail message, then you'll listen to it to make sure that you sound okay. I do that. And it's very effective because sometimes you don't, you don't know how you sound. So, so there are tools out there that can help you. There's also the concept, I love this concept of an honesty mirror, which is where you can find a colleague that you trust to give you feedback on a presentation. So, hey, how do you think that meeting went? Hey, do you feel like I gave an effective communication uh, during that presentation? Do you think the client was happy? So if you can find that person in your organization or within the profession who can give you that feedback, that is so incredibly helpful. And, and you can do the same for them. So, you know, so that they don't feel like a jerk when they said, well, you said, um, a few times, uh, you, you can both do it for each other and that can be very helpful. And then there's also, of course, the more formal strategies like Toastmasters, uh, that, that can help as well. Okay. So the next slide is about capitalizing on networking events. 
that's why you all see me at happy hour because I'm training to capitalize on, to be an expert on capitalizing on networking events. Uh, but they really can be quite useful, uh, especially for your, for your professional growth, for your uh, relationship building. I will say that, uh, so I was, I recently finished my tenure as chair for APA Florida, or excuse me, APA Sunco section, I'm getting ahead of myself, uh, the APA Sunco section, and uh, I cannot tell you how many people reached out to say, hey, do you know anyone who would be good at this position? Do you know anyone who would be a good fit for this? So that having that relationship and having those um, uh, connections will, will help you so much over the course of your career because so many jobs, especially in the private sector, are not advertised. It's just word of mouth. So the more people that you know and the more connections you can make, uh, then, then that's a great way to really keep your career moving forward. And there's a couple of strategies for networking events. So you always want to, it's easier to approach an odd number of group. So it's easier to approach groups of one, obviously, or three or five, because there's always an open person that, that you can talk to. So that's an easy way if you go to a networking event and you don't know a lot of people, that's an easy way to uh, you know, walk, pit, find a group and, and talk with them. Of course, at networking events, you also don't want to be looking around to see who else is coming in while you're having a conversation with someone. Mm -hmm. That I, it's very obvious when people do that, so you wanna make sure you're maintaining that eye contact bringing business cards, and some people will like to have a short elevator pitch about what they do. I typically find that if that comes up too early in the conversation, it sounds a little forced. So saving that for a little later in the conversation, I think is usually a little more effective. And then I want to talk about the, the power of breaking bread. So this was, um, I think, touched on, or this has been something that has been brought up to me. So. Someone said to me once that it is extremely difficult for people to criticize you or feel negatively towards you if you have had a meal with them. So if you have, there's something about sitting down together, talking over a meal uh, that can really help a relationship uh, even before it, it starts. So if you think that, you know, you know what, I know this, this may, we may have some conflict that, that we may be having to address, conflict is not necessarily negative, you know, a, a good strategy is before that meeting, take that person to coffee, uh, go to lunch with them. I know that we're all busy. I know that, that everyone has record permits that, that they're working on, but taking the time to really go to lunch or coffee with people can really go a long way towards uh, having a, a productive professional relationship. And then finally, this is similar to the be kind uh, concept, but just being as helpful as possible and trying to help people wherever you can. Uh, there's the whole reciprocity concept. So if you do something that is helpful or beneficial to someone, they then at some point will want to help you in the future. So, you know, really making sure that whenever you have an opportunity to assist someone to send an email at six o'clock at night because it would really help someone out. Those small things uh, really, really make a big difference in terms of relationship building. Um, so I think that's the end of, uh, so I think this may be a repeat slide, but we do have some ethical principles related to uh, relationship building as well. Um, so I think, so it's a little awkward to moderate and ask myself a question. So I think Amy is going to ask the, the first question about relationship building. Sure. So um, Melissa, you mentioned the power of breaking bread, which is fantastic. It's always great to go out and get coffee with someone. But at what point do you have to look at any ethical gray areas of, you know, going out and having dinner and drinks with someone outside of work? Sure, so that's a great point. So that's something we do have to be really careful about in terms of the perception of a conflict of interest. So here at the conference, there's a lot of consultants, there's a lot of public sector planners, everyone's together. Um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of opportunity for perceived conflicts of interest. And also, uh, you know, I think one rule of thumb is you know, if, if there's someone who has a, has a private application and I'm the reviewer, maybe it's not a good idea for us to be seen out 
you know, having a glass of wine somewhere, just the two of us, um, you know, if you handle all the RFPs and RFQs for your organization, maybe it's not the best idea for you to be seen only hanging out with one consultant. You know, I think being conscious of that and being aware of perception is the most important part. And when in doubt, my personal philosophy is just wait. You know, if you're best friends with someone who has a development uh, coming in, A, try not to be the case planner on it, um, but then B, making sure that, you know, if, if there is any social opportunity that that, that happens after the case is, is done. I think those simple rules really help make it easier. That's great. And um, Doug, I had a question for you uh, as far as uh, verbal cues and things like that go when you are negotiating. Um, you know, Melissa, you touched on really be aware of all of the verbal cues that you have. Does Do those verbal cues play a role when you're negotiating? And if so, how? Well, I think they do. A lot of it is, is body language. Um, a lot of it is, is really um, those sort of interpersonal skills that some of us have developed, some of us haven't. Um, you know, looking people in the eye. You know, if, if, you're, if you're responding to somebody and you're, <laughs> you're looking here and there and can't look them in the eye, that's not a good sign generally. Um, uh, maybe more than just insecure, and maybe you're agreeing to something that you can't agree to. But I, th you know, it's it's uh, really something that you you need to take the time thinking about. And I think um, Melissa's recommendation about having somebody that you work with kind of give you some input on on those kinds of things are really helpful. You know, a best buddy, just trying to you know help to be the best you can be. But it, I think it definitely does come into play. Um, and just because someone um, gets a little testy, um, uh, uh, do deposition work as well. And attorneys will try to provoke you. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll try to get you. And, and I mean, that's 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 part of their job. Uh, they're trying to obtain information. But um, they play on uh, on emotions. They um, uh, will will try to get information out of you or get you to say something. And so um, it's learning to just be be calm and and um, a great comment, you know, unless you're a Navy SEAL, you can afford to be kind to people. Um, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, it's, it's something that we should uh, really put, put into put into practice. Uh, yeah. And Melissa, have you ever had an experience um, where you are trying to keep your emotions in check and by doing so you focus on those verbal cues and um, that sort of thing? Yeah, so Right now, I'm keeping my emotions in check. Uh, no, I think so. So one thing that that I know that that I will do is if I feel uncomfortable, and everyone does this, but you, you start to shrink. Everyone does this. You can see it all the time. But if people feel uncomfortable, they they shrink down. So making sure if that starts happening, to try to make yourself as open as possible. There's um, a great book by Amy Cuddy called Presence that really talks about that, that's something. And then also, um, you know, you can feel it when, when you're getting frustrated or you're getting upset. And that's a great time to sort of take a deep breath and slow down and try to try to maintain that emotional composure. Um, those those things good. really work. And I do think we're getting close to the end. So okay. maybe we want to, uh, it's about 11.15. So I wanted to see if anyone has any questions uh, from the audience. Anyone? Yes. I counted six phone calls. Oh dear. <laughs> Thank you. See, honesty mirror. Thank you. Yeah. I think the biggest problem in, in, in with, the eth with perception and ethics in our profession is that the sooner you start communication on projects, public project or a private development, the sooner you start communication with all stakeholders, the easier it becomes. The problem becomes, uh, for example, on the private of representing a private developer, they, they may not be able to afford to pay all their professionals to come to community meeting after community meeting after community meeting. And, and so they say, well, I'm just going to meet the minimum notification requirements. And they fight the bloody battle at the first public hearing because the public only gets the notice two weeks before a planning board hearing, and it's the first time they're hearing about something. 
So, and on, even on the public side, my, uh, if I recall back in the 2011 community planning act, the evaluation and appraisal report process was basically gutted. And, and I was at a previous APA state conference meeting where it was part of the law credit. They talked about the community planning process, and that provision was eliminated by the request of local governments because they didn't want to pay to have this communication process about how to update the comp plan. And if the, once that comp plan is adopted, that's, that sets up the battle in the future that the residents weren't involved in. Uh, you know, when a project comes forward, you're saying, well, I'm complying with the comp plan, but the first one didn't even know there was one. So, I guess my, my thing is that's, that's what we, on the public and private side, it's the money and it's the communication issue about doing that work up front that kind of puts a cloud over people think that, you know, uh, the city's in on it, you know, because they've had meetings for a year with the developer and the ERC or whatever, and it, it, they weren't included in that process up front. And the same thing, like I said, with when you're changing the top plan, if you're meeting the minimum standards of notification, the public doesn't know what you're doing in your top plan. And I don't know how we overcome that, but I think that's the biggest perception about why our profession looks like we're not transparent. Melissa, help. Just real quickly on that, I feel like, um, I feel like maybe for some time there as planners, we, we felt the need to justify our existence, right? And in doing so, we got very verbose, right? We created these very complex processes and, and, and institutions and, 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 and uh, statutes and, and, and this. Uh, and we were the experts in that area, right? You needed a planner to navigate those. But I, I feel like people understand our worth in the community and now it's time for us to start kind of pulling back on that sort of thing. I find that most of our comp plans and our land development codes are written to other planners. It's as if we're trying to impress another planner with our document. I remember a planner I worked for one time, we had just finished a DRI for a client and he picked the thing up and he hefted it for weight and he goes, yeah, that feels like a million dollars. And I feel like that's what we're doing right now. Like we look at it and we're like, well, look, if it, if it fit in one three ring binder, then clearly you didn't do all the work you could have done. You know? <laughs> so we're not writing to the people that we're serving, we're writing to other planners and other professionals. I think that's something that needs to change in the culture uh, of planning. Um, and that applies to everything, our, our, our notifications, make it more transparent, make it easily accessible to the average public because they're gonna find it. These aren't the days of like a land development code that just stayed up on the shelf and only, only a few people had access to it. That land development code is available on Municode for everybody to see and critique for that matter. So I think we have some work to do as planners to make ourselves um, more available and to make planning more available to the general public. And I, I, to follow up, I think government has made more of an effort to be transparent because now you can download agendas mm -hmm. for all the different meetings that are going on. The problem is people are overwhelmed. And, but uh, my thought is that every HOA had a government liaison person that probably you know, worked at one point or another that we can kind of keep track of that. And I think the Red Bug uh, Lake Road Coalition in uh, Seminole County, they basically represented about 20 homeowners associations and they, they knew the process mm -hmm. and they could communicate. Uh, those are the kind of things you're right. I mean, right now we're kind of writing without a lot of, not writing to the general public, we're writing to ourselves. It's a big Star Trek convention. We're all just <laughs> in a big Star Trek. Yeah, was there a question? Just, just a real quick point on that. The most recent uh, addition Chapa um, is a tribute to the legacy of uh, my favorite first name, Mark Shero, Ar uh, Arnstein, Arnstein's ladder of uh, mm -hmm. public outreach and participation, and it offers a lot of good ideas and critiques of the profession. And are we getting the public? Are they informed participants, or is it tokenism, etc.? So, it might be worth looking at if you're interested in that subject. And I would also say, too, that social media can now play a very big role in those types of situations. Um, a great example is for um, for several counties that I know of, we've we've started the process of trying to get public comment ahead of a board meeting um, through Facebook and, uh, you know, through social media. Uh, and trying to see what kind of comments we're going to get before it gets 
to the board. Uh, in addition, we uh, have um, what we call our project pipeline, where if a project comes in, it's very transparent, everyone can see the plans, and uh, even on a location map, and we actually post hey, this week we had nine new plans approved. Take a look at them and we, you know, list them out. These are the new plans that have, that have come in this week. And uh, so people can see what's going on in our community and uh, we can be very transparent about that through social media. We yeah. need, apparently it's okay to make major public policy decisions on Twitter now too. So. <laughs> <laughs> A hundred percent, yes. Mm -hmm. I think we need to copy and paste Amy for other communities. Uh, they do a really, a really incredible job in Pasco County, Florida, with uh, Amy's leadership there. Yeah. Did you have a? You're not reading it into the record, but you're just posting it out as Instagram. Currently. Correct. Well, as much as you can do that. Right. So you have a. <laughs> Absolutely. The most effective way is face to face. But for that single dad who's working three jobs, that's not always possible. So now you can really hear the voices of your community that you can't reach with a face to face meeting. Any other questions? Any more honesty mirrors? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you all very much. Thanks.